What's up, Packers fans? Aaron Negler here with my good buddy, Andy Herman of the Pack-A-Day podcast and purveyor of fine Packers takes wherever you go on the internet. Andy, Victory Monday, an unexpected one, I might say. I'm fully admitting that, uh, yeah, wasn't uh, ready for them to pull out the W last night, but that's exactly what they did. I don't know where to start, but I'll just say, Yash Nyman, come on. Yash Nyman and an entire offensive line that had made what one true road start and, uh, you know, outside of Billy Turner. Um, I mean, it's incredible. And I think football, we love to make football complex, but at the end of the day, it's about the line of scrimmage more often than not. And why I think you and myself and a lot of other people thought that this was maybe not going to end well for green Bay was the fact that the advantage on both, you know, offensive line and defensive line. Um, and it could get, you know, ugly in both scenarios, but on both sides of the ball, Green Bay made that even. And ultimately, at the end of the day, if you can make this a game of Jimmy Garoppolo throwing 40 passes and Trey Sermon running 10 times and make this right. about Aaron Rodgers versus Jimmy Garoppolo, yeah, that sounds much more palatable than San Francisco never needing to pass the ball because you can't stop the run and not being able to get a run game going. Green Bay stayed balanced. San Francisco didn't. I thought San Francisco put a, a pretty good effort in at the end with maybe some benefit of a couple, you know, Interesting calls here and there, but calls, heck no of a doubt. performance, especially on the fronts, but just overall by the Packers. So we haven't heard from LaFleur yet. He's speaking later today. But one thing I'm interested in hearing is if there was any kind of emphasis put on, because it looked like they went to a bunch more kind of man blocking concepts in the run game where we know traditionally they are a very zone centric team, but there were a lot of straight up either man blocks, angle blocks, double teams, trying to get to the second level on the linebacker, et cetera. And I do wonder if that was maybe a byproduct of the fact that he did have a lot of youth along that offensive line. But they, uh, to your point, they did a great job moving bodies in a way. It would, might not always have been road grading. They weren't like right. plowing guys five yards down the field, but there was plenty of space for Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon to get going. Dillon ripped off a couple six-yard runs, really nice stuff from Jones getting skinny, in in the wash so to speak but i really was impressed by the way they were able to fire off the line and move things the way they needed to in the run game yeah i thought they did a good job there and it you know it's not always as always it's it's a it's more the minutiae and the details right it's not always those big 20 30 yard gains that you know really do you in it's those three four five six yarders that just kind of beat you down over the course of the game and again it allowed green bay to stay balanced we didn't see a bunch of play action i don't think green bay wanted rogers really turning his back i don't think green bay wanted rogers holding the ball that long i think they wanted him to get the ball out of his hands i still thought it was interesting that even going to, to the running game that you mentioned it, this didn't feel still like a normal Matt LaFleur offense. There was a lot of spread stuff. There was a lot of, uh, you know, 11 personnel. There was, there wasn't much motion, not a lot of play action, not many. I don't know if there was a single bootleg the entire game. I can understand why, but it was still interesting that this still seemed a bit off from the normal Matt LaFleur game plan, but Matt LaFleur's biggest thing is he's going to take advantage of what he's playing against. And I thought knowing that that defensive line is so good and can fire off the ball and get to the quarterback that getting the ball out of Rogers hands and certainly getting it to Devontae Adams as much as possible against a weak cornerback group was a good game plan. And certainly it worked. Yeah. And you heard Aaron mention that after the game regarding getting the ball out of his hands quickly being part, right. a major part of the game plan. Of course, like you're saying, it does make sense. It's funny though, on the motion thing, there was like a stretch. It was weird. Like there was a stretch of like, three or four plays where they suddenly used Amari Rogers as kind of the jet motion guy. True, That's a good point. But then they went away from it and they never got back to it. So to your point, like, yeah, it did not look like the offense we've gotten used to with Matt and Aaron and the motion and things of that nature. Uh, it, it's going to be interesting to go back and look now that the all 22 will be available um, to kind of see what, what they did that was, similar yet different you know that we've heard right. matt talk about that a lot as far as window dressing and making guys second guess because you still saw condensed formations you still saw um what you know moving Devonte around whether it was on the perimeter in the slot what have you um there's no doubt that like you said to get the ball out of aaron's hands quickly and utilizing the passing game as an extension of the running game something that we've heard a lot about and they certainly did that with Devonte in the slot yesterday yeah, they did. And I thought, yeah, even the, it was interesting, even the, the couple deep balls to MVS early in the game, Alan Lazard, like 
those were still like quick three-step drops and then like just right. a beautiful yep. lollipop deep ball to Lazard and MVS. Like they, they weren't messing around. Uh, and again, they got the ball out of his hands quickly. And like you said, I'm, I'm interested to watch the all 22 to see how this kind of looks in totality, but either way, it, it wasn't a traditional Matt LaFleur game plan, but I thought it was a successful game plan. And ultimately at the end of the day, that's what matters. Absolutely. And the thing that I found so I'm not going to say satisfying, but I, I love the little, there's a little aside that Matt has in his post game presser where he talks about learning lessons and learning the lessons from 2019 when they got beat down twice and the adjustment necessary up to this up, up till last night, I was not, you know, I, I was not uh, too confident in the ability for Lafleur and Rogers to really adjust what they want to do on offense. Like they are a very game plan specific team week to week, but it sure seemed, to your point, to be within the confines of what they've constructed offensively, the scheme, the rhythm of everything. And last night, the rhythm was very different and their approach was very different. And that's what I was wondering. Like, could they kind of take a different approach? You know, obviously stick with the run as much as the, as you can, even though they still got pass heavy at times. But to see them do exactly what you're talking about, as far as we know, regardless, even if we have you know, a clean drop back game, we still got to let Aaron still got to let it fly quickly because we do yeah. not want to take five, seven step drops and give these defensive ends a real easy target point. Uh, we don't want to do a bunch of bootleg stuff, roll into pressure uh, as we've seen happen a couple times early on this season. So that to me was the biggest question mark, you know, really good team, really good front. Could they adjust their approach? And my God, they certainly did last night. Yeah, they, they answered that, I think, very clearly. And I think it was Aaron, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was Aaron in his post-game press conference where he said one of the adjustments that they made was just keeping players in to, to chip a little bit more and yep. and Tunyon and, and, run, and, and Aaron Jones and the running backs. And that uh, I think in the previous matchups against San Francisco, you know, they were lining up wide and they were just kind of putting their tackles on an island and it wasn't working out as well. That was something they really wanted to adjust. And I thought – it really paid off big dividends, especially on that last drive where they did it to get Devonte open. There's the play where Robert Tunyon had the the pancake uh, on uh, on both. I think it was. I, I thought that adjustment was really really keen. It wasn't anything like there was no you know rocket science there. It's not anything that hasn't been done before, but it was a sound right. adjustment and right. it certainly worked in this game. Absolutely. Let, let's flip it over to the defensive side for a bit. Um, I mean, Kenny Clark was an absolute wrecking machine last night uh, from the first snap to right up till the end. I thought. It's funny we talk about needing to get Kenny help. Well, Kenny last night basically said, I'm, I don't need help. Yeah. I'm going to do it all myself. And that's not to say, because I thought Tyler Lancaster had the best game he's played probably in the last two or three years. Or ever. Um, <laughs> and for a very long time. Uh, Kingsley Kiki flashed. He wasn't dominant, what have you. But what they got from Lancaster really helped. I mean, even not so much like there was the obvious one where he beat Mac to for the pressure that turned into a group sack. But just holding up in the run game for the most part. I thought he really did a good job of getting his pads low. Um, but, you know, you look at Kenny and the way he just absolutely wrecked shop. Of course, the big, big play at the end of the game there where he gets the turnover that turns into points. That's monster. But, man, Kenny Clark, one man wrecking machine last night. No question about it. I thought Zach Cruz made a great point last night. It's something you and I have both echoed in the past as well. When Kenny Clark is going well, this defense is going well. And when Kenny Clark is struggling, this defense is probably going to struggle. And last night he was going well, and this defense played much, much better. And I really like, from a Tyler Lancaster standpoint, I like that they've given those two – the ability to flip a little bit more and yep. have, you know, we saw Kenny Clark win at nose tackle right over Alex Mack, where he just bench pressed Alex Mack about five yards into the, the backfield on the play, which was amazing. But we've also seen him have a lot of success over guard the last couple games with Tyler at the nose tackle. And yep. it just as like when you can line up Z at every spot on the field, you can basically pick, all right, which one's your worst offensive lineman. I'm going to put Z over that guy. This gives you a little bit more flexibility to say, all right, instead of just Kenny, you know, ramming his head against, you know, Ryan Jensen in the NFC championship game against Tampa Bay, even though Kenny played great in that game too. Like it, instead of that, like we're going to be able to move him and try to maybe pick our, pick the guy that we want him to match up a little bit more. I thought and if Tyler can hold up in that situation and do well in that situation, then that that's, that's even a, a bonus, but I thought that's been a really nice adjustment over the last six ish quarters of football. No doubt about it. Um, talking about adjustments, it, it was interesting coming off of last week and all the unfortunate narrative regarding the halftime adjustment that Matt had talked to Joe Barry about, and we got to send pressure and we're not getting home with four. I was impressed with the fact that 
they sent a few more blitzes last night, but after the real heavy pressure that he sent in the red zone where they got beat for the touchdown, uh, they had the corner stop that, you know, that's a real tough one for Jair there. I mean, I don't really put that on him. Uh, he's totally on an Island and that guy's got all day to operate because you're sending pressure. You don't want to play up. Um, the fact that after that call, Joe was very judicious with how, where he, he still sent a few things, but for the most part, especially towards the end, he really made them earn it, go all the way down the field, only rushing four. And I kept thinking, okay, he's going to get impatient. He's going to get impatient and call some kind of big Bob Slowick backbreaking blitz. And he, it never happened. And I, that, that's the kind of thing that will probably not get talked about outside of nerds like us, but that's the kind of thing you want to see as far as game management, knowing your personnel, knowing the situation and not overcompensating and having the patience. Uh, you know, that to me was pretty damn impressive on Barry's part. Was every once in a while you'll have a, a deep, like the Seahawks defense where they got Richard Sherman and Cam Chancellor and Earl Thomas, and you're just made for cover three. And you can just basically right. do the same thing down and down out and say, good luck. Every <laughs> once in a while, you'll have a Chicago right. Bears defense where you can have Brian Urlacher roaming in the middle of the field and Peanut Tillman and all those guys. And we can just run Tampa two and say, good luck. But unless you have just elite talent and the exact right pieces to run a specific scheme, you have to throw the kitchen sink. And I don't mean that from like blitzing nine guys. I mean, right. like you got to have even the evil three man rush at a time. You have to do uh, a, a zero. Blitz. Truly you evil. Nothing. I know. But you got to do, you got to do. But you're, right. you're right. I, I know you're right. You're right. You, you yeah. got to do a little of everything because the offenses are just so well-rounded now that if you're not disguising things, if you're not changing things up, they know how to be, they know how to beat every single coverage. They know how to beat every single stunt. They know how to beat all of it. Uh, so you have to be multiple in what you're doing. And it's not always going to work. If there was something that was perfect down in and down out, a, a, a double A gap blitz was working every time. Every team would run it every play, but we were, nobody's in that situation. And I thought Joe Barry, this, especially against San Francisco, listen, I know that they converted some plays. Like I thought everything was much more contested in this game. The, the play to Debo yes. Samuel on that last drive, Jai Alexander, the best corner right in football there. is like, just it, yep. Debo just makes a fantastic freaking play. There's the play where Savage is crashing. You got, you know, Devondre Campbell running to the foot, like everything was faster and much more intense and, and, uh, and much more contested give San Francisco some credit and you have to tip your cap to the opposing offense sometimes. But I thought with some, some poor penalties that were maybe called against them and, and just some, some really great plays by San Francisco, they were able to get back in that game. But I thought this was by far and away the best defensive performance of the season so far. To that point regarding the contesting of, of everything basically that was put, I mean, there were hardly any you know, screaming wide open guys like we saw back in 2019 in both of those games. Um, <laughs> what did you think of the play of Eric Stokes in place of Kevin King in regards, especially to the fact that I'm, I'm assuming now, maybe there's something more to this, but I'm assuming, you know, Eric Stokes didn't wake up yesterday thinking he was starting on Sunday night football, you know, and the fact that Kevin King is then declared out and he gets thrown into the mix. I'm sure he practiced all week in certain packages and certain situational calls, but I don't think he was planning on starting. And there he was thrown into the fire. And I thought he held up pretty damn well. He's the second best corner on the team. And I don't, I don't need to see much more tape. I'm excited to see the all 22 on him this week. And there's going to be hiccups. There's going to be ups and downs. He's a rookie. There's going to be some pass interference calls. There's going to be plays where he get, you know, he takes the cheese and probably gets beat deep. I can live with all of it. He's the second best corner. He has the most pure corner skills on the team, not named Jair Alexander. And if you had to ask me right now, ball in the air, who do I hope the cornerback is? Jair is the first guy. And then it's, and then it's Eric Stokes, and then you can pick your, you know, pecking order the rest of the way. And then roll the um, dice. <laughs> exactly. But to me, he's he's number two, and uh, I'll live with some of the mistakes. And frankly, he probably needs to make some of those mistakes to learn from him so that he's a better corner, um, hopefully by the end of the season or certainly down the road uh, when he's going to be counted on to be, you know, the guy, of course, uh, opposite Jay Alexander. So he, he needs to be the number two. He should be the number two, and he's he's the number two in, in my mind. Well, you look at uh, the third – uh, they call it, you know, there's a, each offense, defense, and then special teams is a third of the team. I don't know how true that is, but everyone's going to be talking about Mason Crosby today for good reason because he's a hero. He's money Mason. But how about the punter? They not only have a punter Fantastic. for those directional kicks being just outstanding, but the hold on the big kick. I mean, that guy was so smooth. Remember when the trade was made? I literally got like 20 tweets in my mentions about, oh, but what about the operation? What about the holding he's going to have to do? Look pretty good to me. Guy looks smooth in a big spot. 
I mean, this is one of, I would say, early returns suggest one of Brian Gutekunst's better moves as of late. Uh, this kid looks absolute money. I don't remember the last, I don't know if in my lifetime Green Bay's had a directional punter who can, you know, was this consistent, him, right? That consistent. And it's early, early returns, right? But like, it is, it is. I don't know that it's but... happened in my lifetime. And and we've, we've known of the Craig and Trick curse, you know, since they let yeah. him go, there's, there hasn't been a great punter. I, you will see what his ceiling is as a punter and just how good he can be. But right now, as we've talked about for a while, Aaron, we will take competence at special teams uh, <laughs> after the past three decades of what we've seen. Um, so right now, for the most part, things are competent. I know we had the big kick return uh, in, in the first half. That was uh, a little bit backbreaking. But overall, I'm still questioning a little bit of Mari as punt returner. I'm, I'm, you know, there were some yeah, issues. He's, the first he's one he should have ran me fair caught. The second one he lets yep. bounce instead of fair catching. There was a, you know, a couple of returns where he's getting a little too east and west versus north and south. So I Big think time. the the jury's still out there. But I like Kylan as kick returner. I like Bahorquez. I like Mason Crosby. There's a lot better stuff going on on special teams than we've seen in a while. Let's take a quick look forward to uh, this upcoming game with the Steelers, which this is a classic case of, you know, the, the, the beginning of the year or even when the schedule comes out and people are circling, well, this is going to be a tough one. That's going to be a tough one. Certainly last night you thought, oh, that's going to be a tough game. I'll tell you what, Steelers, not looking so tough. Now mm -hmm. I know any given Sunday they will certainly come in and give it their best shot and the Packers have got to be ready for it. But holy hell, does this Steelers team not scare you whatsoever? I mean, the obvious headline here is Big Ben and how just poor, poorly he's played, their inability to run the ball. But to me, it's the Steelers' defense just has not been what I think most people were expecting coming into this season. I, I'm not saying this is a cakewalk. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. But, man, I don't feel nearly as kind of, you know, nervous about the Steelers coming into Lambeau as maybe I did three or four weeks ago. No, it's funny because there was all like the, the the Steelers reports this week of like team is starting to get concerned by Ben Roethlisberger. Did you not watch him? Did at you all watch last year? season? Like this is exactly what happened last. He was terrible. Oh, he was he was terrible. Oh. So and he's looked even worse this season. Some of the plays like this is literally like a blooper reel of plays from this past week against Cincinnati. That's serious. Like Truly. a legitimate. Yes, yeah, it's, it's troubling almost. Um. So you know, again, like you said, any given Sunday. But going back to the defensive side of the ball. Stefan Tuitt is on injured reserve. TJ Watt didn't play last week. His status, we'll see, was up in the air. Tyson Alualu, who's been great for them, has been banged up. Bud Dupree, they lose in free agency. This isn't a team that had, you know, like all star corners. They needed to get that pressure up front to be able to make yep. some, you, you know, they got made up. Front. up but, yep. but the, the, the you know, the corners aren't great. So all of a sudden, you're not getting that, you, you know, Tuitt, Watt, those sort of guys are in Dupree gone or not playing. And you're not getting the pressure. You're not getting the pressure. You're all the some the defensive backs get exposed. There's a lot of ways to take advantage of this Pittsburgh team. Their offensive line is playing insanely poor right now. Um, Najee Harris, their rookie running back, um, it leads the league. Can't get going. It, when he leads the league and getting hit behind the line of scrimmage, he's, he's no, there's nowhere to go. So yeah, exactly. It, you got to you got to take advantage of this game, especially the way Pittsburgh's playing right now, especially with some of the injuries that they have. Again, Green Bay is going to be coming off a very tough, uh, probably emotional uh, Sunday night football game, and they're going to have to get ready for a, a game back at Lambeau against a struggling team. But you also know Pittsburgh's going to be desperate in this game to get back to two and two. At, that is the last thing I'll say is, is this Mike Tomlin era right now feels very end of Mike McCarthy era esque. Where you know yeah, the I, is a great coach. So funny you say that. I had the exact thought watching some of that game yesterday. The kind of guy's been there forever and everyone's just tuned out. And, and I, you know, obviously coach. we're not in the it's locker room. You don't know, but man, yeah. messaging in the NFL, the way guys respond, the famous Bill Walsh quote, you know, a decade is about your shelf life. I mean, it sure looks, like it. it sure looks done in Pittsburgh. However, we all know the NFL is a week to week league and all it takes is one fun, happy performance for Pittsburgh Steelers fans from their favorite team to come into Lambeau and surprise us and, change the narratives for both teams so uh it is definitely going to be a test andy herman can't thank you enough for joining me here on let's talk football look forward to doing it again next week buddy can't wait thanks man